a doctor from British Columbia, or a nurse from Quebec who wants to come and work in Ontario shouldn't face barriers or bureaucratic delays to start providing care. These healthcare workers are highly trained. Other provinces and territories have the same high standards as we have here. So these changes, once implemented, will automatically recognize the credentials of healthcare workers registered in other provinces and territories so they can get the work as soon as they get here. That was Ontario Premier Doug Ford announcing his government will introduce legislation that will automatically recognize the credentials of health care workers registered in other provinces and territories. That announcement comes just a few days after the Premier made waves for his plans to use private care clinics to tackle Ontario's surgical backlog. Will Ontario's private care plans shake up health care for good in Canada and could Ford's changes lead to a no-holds barred battle among the provinces to recruit much needed health care workers. Let's bring in the front bench to weigh in on that subject. Joining us this evening, former British Columbia Premier Christy Clark, former Ontario Premier Kathleen Wynne, and former Nova Scotia Premier Daryl Dexter. Hi, everyone. Great to see you again. If I remember correctly, last week at the end of our conversation, we, we, we edged over to this private public debate and, and, and I thought, hey, there might be an opportunity to discuss it again. Lo and behold, it's already here. <laughs> Uh, Kathleen, I'm going to start with you. And and if for a moment, you know, we kind of put aside all of our partisan leanings, I'm wondering if you think at this juncture versus, let's say, 10 years ago, the notion of talking about anything to do with privatization is the same kind of political lightning that it used to be. Well, I think that right now, Vashi, um, people are very worried about access to health care, you know, so that in itself has made a um, that on its own has made a change in terms of people's willingness to have a conversation. And I think lots of, uh, lots of people are not averse to, I'm not averse to the notion of private delivery. As we talked about, a little bit about last week, there's been private delivery in provinces for years. There's been private delivery in Ontario for years. The piece that's getting muddled in Ontario right now is the distinction between for-profit and not for profit. And the government is not clarifying that, is not explaining why there need to be funds flowing to for profit community health uh, organizations. And there's also not clarity that where it's been done, even in the country, it hasn't worked necessarily. I mean, the, the wait times for hip and knee surgeries in Ontario are better than in Alberta and Saskatchewan where there's more of this. So there is no clear explanation about why the for, why the profit motive has to be part of this. But other than that, I think people are people understand why there need to be uh, an expansion of community delivery of service. I remember Christy covering an Alberta leadership election probably now 10 or 12 years ago between Alison Redford and Gary Marr. And the second Gary Marr said anything to do with privatization, it ended. That is basically what clinched the, uh, the, the PC leadership there for Alison Redford. Do, do you think things have evolved since then? I do. I think that people are, are really starting to see the pointy end of the truth here, which is we cannot continue to think that we're going to have a publicly funded healthcare system that's universally accessible, which is what we all want by just throwing more money at it. There has to be structural change. We can't, we're, you know, we're eating up, you know, a third to a quarter, a quarter to a third of provincial budgets already on it. It's going to squeeze out our ability to pay for education and all those other things. So I think people post COVID and this, after this crisis we've gone through are saying, and I think Doug Ford has identified this in spades, just please do something, please figure something out. And we don't even really, care about all the details as much as the fact that we want it to be better. So, you know, I think that what Premier Ford has done is going in the right direction. Um, I don't think it's nearly enough. I mean, it's not structural change to the system, but it is going to have some impact. And, you know, on the specifics of his, uh, his, his announcement, hell yeah. If you're, if you're a doctor or a nurse or a trucker or a teacher or whatever it is anywhere in Canada, you should be able to work anywhere in Canada. We should have free trade of labor all across this country. So um, specifically on that front, I would say good for you, Doug Ford. Let's make sure we take on the special interests, the unions, the colleges and all of those professional bodies that hold back the free movement of labor and let people work where they want. 
Uh, Daryl, I know that, uh, you know, I, I, for as long as I've been coming prov covering provincial politics, breaking down barriers of trade or other between provinces has been something that has been really difficult to actually get accomplished. Do, do you think this is a good move or is it potentially, uh, I guess, a bit of a, a hindrance to other provinces which are also facing staffing shortages? No, I think the um, the accreditation uh, equivalency is something that's long overdue, and and uh, it's something that that um, you know we worked hard on in the at least in the Atlantic provinces with you know lots of other uh, trade groups to try and get that kind of equivalency uh, recognition. So no, I think that's that's um, I'm not sure that the way that he's going about doing it is necessarily going to be popular with everybody, but I think it is the right thing. Um, that we see a, a, a level of equivalency for healthcare workers across the country. I, I don't. I don't see that as a problem. I, I, where I would differ, of course, is on the whole question of his approach to um, uh, the actual service standard and delivery. Because I, I, I'm not sure how this is going to help the situation at all. Um, we every decision is made in a specific context, and this one is made in the context of a of a health human resource drought that we are existing that is existing across the across the country so i'm not sure how you know taking people out of the public system and putting them into the private system is going to help um, there's no magic pool of healthcare human resources that the private system has access to that the public system doesn't. So they're essentially going to be drawing those workers out of uh, the, the, uh, the public system and impoverishing it. And I, and I think, you know, likely making outcomes worse rather than better. And Vashi, you know, a few seconds. Yeah, go ahead, Kathleen. I'll get well, you I, was just, I was just going to say he needed, and I, I'm sorry to be partisan here, but he needed a positive announcement. Um, he's taking flack on the the for-profit delivery, um, and and he needed an announcement. It's I'm with Daryl though. It's kind of meaningless because everybody is having trouble with healthcare, human resources. So, you know, it it's a it's me, great. I think let me let me let me be idea. the contrary voice I'm not in this, sure Gashi, which is make. to say, uh, if you ha if you move, yeah, I'll people get you in one second, Christy. Sorry. Okay. I promise you, I'll get you. Just let Kathleen finish, and then I'll get right to. I'll get oh, both sorry. those voices. In yeah, no, I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> Okay, never mind, uh, just Christy, to, go ahead. Be the contrary voice. Well, to yeah. say, you know, here's the benefit. You move people out of a heavily bureaucratic system, which is hugely expensive, which doesn't make decisions fast, if at all, which is has all these incredible work rules, which make it very hard for people to do things well and quickly and wisely and make and make changes on the go. And you move them into a system where the staff can make those decisions. Suddenly, you have staff that are way, way more efficient, doctors that are able to fill up their slate with, um, with surgeries because there's always a space for the, in which for them to work. So you're taking people out of an inefficient system and putting them into an efficient system, you will get more of their time. And that's part of yeah, the calculation, I think, that pre that yeah, that, that's me. that's just I, not that's I, just not true. That's just not, not true. true. Those are tropes about the public Medicare system that have long not been true. disproven. Well, that wait, somehow the Darryl, private okay, system I, is more efficient. I, I got to take control of this because everyone's talking over each other, and I apologize. I'm going to take a quick down the middle approach and then take a break because we got a whole other subject to talk about. Look, there are definitely concerns about uh, the the lack of uh, staff already, and that the private, you know. Funneling money to the private sector uh, will lure those staff and leave the public system void. But there are also, you know, genuine concerns about the way that the public system is operating right now. Um, in, you know, to play devil's advocate, I think that the premier says at least that's what he's trying to address. I got to take a quick break. But all three of those former premiers are sticking around because on the other end of that break, we're going to talk about leadership and when you know it's the time to go that shocking resignation from New Zealand's Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern after the break.